rain stopped a little bit, but it's been a little bit of a monsoon season here, and uh, I'm kind of enjoying it. The weather's cooling down a little bit. I don't mind the rain. We have a nice covered back porch so we can go sit on the back porch and watch the rain, so that's all good. But I'm excited to be here tonight, and if you guys would open up your Bibles to uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, that's where we're going to be preaching out of tonight. I just love when God confirms things. When God gives you confirmation, because, you know, we're just like weak, fallible human beings. And every time when I I know that I'm going to be preaching, I always pray and, of course, ask God, what do you want me to preach? And I'm never totally sure. Like, I feel like God wants me to preach this message, or I feel like God wants me to preach out of this scripture. But then, of course, God gives you those confirmations over and over and over, but then again, even though even when the day comes, the devil starts playing with your mind, like, is this the message that you want me to preach, God? I don't know if you guys picked up one of these, the word for the day today. The, the church gives these out. They're like a three-month devotional. And this morning, my wife texted me, and she goes, babe, the devotion for today, for Wednesday, September 26th, is out of the passage that you're gonna be preaching tonight. So I know that I know that I know that God wants me to preach this message. That means that there's somebody here, if not all of you here, that God wants to speak this message to tonight. So not only am I excited because this message is very personal to me, but I'm excited because I know that there's somebody here that needs to hear this message. Amen. The title of my message tonight is called Look Long and Prosper. Look Long and Prosper. But before I get started, I want to read this verse. It's out of James chapter 1, verses 22 through 24, if you want to turn there. Um, James chapter 1, verses 22 through 24, it says this, and we'll also have it on the back screen, actually. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are fooling yourself. If you listen to the word and don't obey it, it is like you're glancing at your face in the mirror And you walk away and you forget what you look like. He says, don't just be a hearer of the word, be a doer. And if you're just a hearer of the word, it's like looking at a mirror, walking away and forgetting what you look like. You know, that scenario is borderline absurd. The fact that someone, the average person, could walk to a mirror and look at themselves and then turn away and walk away and forget what they look like. It's inconceivable, but I think that's the point behind this scripture, right? That's the whole idea behind this scripture. It's supposed to be a little over the top because as Christians, it should be inconceivable to hear something out of scripture and to not apply it to our lives. I wanted to start off with a scripture. I know it's a little bit of a tough scripture, but I really wanted to start off with this because my prayer coming up to tonight has been that the Holy Spirit would speak to you that the Holy Spirit would stir something up inside of you. That way, when God opens the door for you to live out what I'm gonna preach tonight, that you won't miss the opportunity. And I, I know that we can't guarantee God is gonna do something, but I would almost bet, if I was a betting man, I would bet on this, that God is gonna open up the door for you to do exactly what I'm gonna preach to you tonight. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but a week from now, maybe a month from now, maybe a year from now, I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit stirs up inside of you this message and you recognize and you live out that word, that rhema word. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bring to remembrance this passage, Lord God, when the doors are opened, Lord God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'd open up our hearts to receive this message. God, I pray that you would speak through me, Lord, that it wouldn't be I that speaks, but it would be you that speaks. Holy Spirit, speak to the hearts and to the souls of each individual in this room, including myself. I pray these things in Christ Jesus' mighty and holy name, amen. Again, I am excited to be up here and to be able to preach tonight, and this message does really hit home for me. It's something that I really am passionate about and something that is really, really important, particularly in my life, but I pray that it's gonna be in your life as well. But before we get started into that, I wanna share something that I found on the internet. And you know, the internet's always true, so this has to be true. 
And since I'm a media pastor, you know that I spend a lot of time on the internet. So I found this survey. It's an online survey that lists all the qualities people expect from the perfect pastor. All the qualities that people expect from the perfect pastor. The perfect pastor preaches exactly 12 minutes. I'm here to tell you that my message is gonna go a little longer than 12 minutes, so I'm not the perfect pastor. The perfect pastor is 28 years old, but has 30 years of experience. Can't do the math, but. The perfect pastor works from 8 a.m. until midnight, but they always make time for their family. I love this one. The perfect pastor frequently condemns sin, but he never upsets anybody. He frequently condemns sin, but never upsets anybody. The perfect pastor drives a good car, has a good home, reads good books, and with the rest of their money, they give it cheerfully to those in need. On a daily basis, the perfect pastor makes 25 calls to families in the congregation while also visiting the homebound and the hospitalized. And all the rest of their time, they spend evangelizing to the unchurched people in the community, but they're always available and in the office when you call. (laughs) And of course, the perfect pastor is very good looking. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this is a joke or at least I hope it's a joke. The the survey didn't say that this was a joke or not. It very well could be what people consider the perfect pastor. You don't know, but I'm taking it as a joke because we have a couple pastors here. We have Pastor Paul, Pastor Larry. They're probably like the most godly men that I've ever met, and they're not perfect. There's no such thing as the perfect pastor, right? Why? Because all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. All of us are fallible. There's no perfect pastor. There was only one perfect person who ever walked the earth, and it was who? Jesus. That's why I love this verse. In Philippians chapter three, verse 12, Paul says this. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press towards that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. He's saying, not that I'm already perfect or that I've already reached perfection, but I continue to press forward towards that perfection which is found only in Christ Jesus. Does that mean that we're gonna be perfect always? No. That means that we're gonna fall sometimes. That means we're gonna do things wrong. That means we're gonna mess up. But what it means is we are gonna get back up and continue to press forward towards that which is perfect. We'll never reach perfection on this side of eternity. You know, it won't be until after we get to heaven when we have our glorified bodies, when we're walking on the streets of gold, when there'll be no more tears and no more pain. But we can continue to press forward and move towards that perfection. We can continue to every day to try to be more and more and more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he is our perfect role model. Christ is our example of how we are to treat other people. Christ is our example of the influence we can and should have on people around us. Christ is our classic and eternal example of a role model that we should try to be like. There's no other role model that even comes close. I have mentors in my life, and I'm sure you have mentors in your life, and people that you look up to, godly men and women, but none of them even compare to Jesus. If you look at Scripture, a quick look through Scripture, we we find a, a Christ who finds people where they are, and he takes people to where they need to be. We see a Christ who seeks people out who thought they were nobodies and shows them they were somebodies. We, have, we see a Christ who takes fishermen and turns them into fishers of men. You see a Christ who takes a drug addict alcoholic and he turns him into a pastor. And that same Christ who walked around 2,000 years ago making somebody's 
on a nobody's is still walking around here today. There's a reason why Paul says he's continuing to press forward to that perfection. There's a reason why God made us in his image. There's a reason why he shapes us to be like Christ. Because God wants us to be his influencers. God wants us to be his hands and feet to the people around us. So that way everywhere we go, every person that we meet, can see the glory of Christ reflected in our lives. I want to read this passage out of 2 Kings because this is the passage that really stirred up this message. And I I don't know if you guys know this, but Elijah and Elisha, who we find in this passage, are two of my favorite characters in the Old Testament. I've been here one year and I've already preached one message on these two characters. I just love Elijah and Elisha. And in case you don't know the backstory, many of you probably do, but Elijah is the older and Elisha is the younger. And we find in 1 Kings, Elijah is hiding in a cave, fearing for his life. And God comes to Elijah and says, find Elisha, the oxen farmer, and I want you to go to him and put your mantle on him, put your cloak on him, because he's going to be your successor. And now we find in 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah and Elisha again, but now they're at the end of their walk together. In 2 Kings chapter 2, I'm going to read most of this, 1 through 14, not all of it, but most of it. It starts off by saying this, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. Skipping to verse four, it says, then Elijah, oh wait, to go to Bethel. But Elijah replied, as surely as the Lord lives, and as surely as you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went to Bethel together. Now skipping down to verse four, it says, then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord told me to go to Jericho. But Elisha again replied, As surely as the Lord lives, and as surely as you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went together to Jericho. Then in verse 6 we see, Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to the Jordan River. But again, Elisha replies, as surely as the Lord lives and as surely as you live, I will never leave you. So they went there together. Now in verse 7, 50 men from a group of prophets also went and watched from a distance as Elijah and Elisha stopped beside the Jordan River. Then Elijah folded up his cloak together and struck the water with it and the river divided and the two walked across on dry ground. Can you imagine that being part of that 50? You're just sitting back there watching from a distance. Elijah and Elisha, they show up in this river and all of a sudden, wham, and the river just splits. Woo, that would be awesome. (laughs) When the two came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. And Elisha replied, Please let me get a double share or a double portion of your spirit and become your successor. Now I think this is the part of the scripture that most of us know, that that Elisha asked for the double portion. And this is an important part of the scripture. But I think there's so much more in this story that we're going to gain. And Elijah replied, You have asked the difficult thing. If you see me when I'm taken away, then you will get your request. But if not, you won't. It's like, okay. If you see me taken away by God, you're gonna get it. But if you don't, you're out of luck. And as they were walking along, suddenly a chariot of fire, drawn by horses of fire, appeared. That drove between the two men, separating them. And Elijah was carried away in a whirlwind into heaven. That would be awesome to see. (laughs) Elisha saw it and he cried out, my father, my father, I see the chariot and the charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, Elisha tore his clothes in distress. 
And Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when he was taken away. Then Elijah returned to the banks of the Jordan River. He struck the river with Elijah's cloak, and he cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Then the river divided, and Elisha walked across. And like I said, we first, when we hear this story, and I've heard this message preached so many times, we talk about the double portion. And of course, that's good, because who doesn't want a double portion? When I get ice cream, I always want at least more than one scoop. When I get an Oreo cookie, I can't just have one. So it's important. But what I see here is a mentor and a mentee. What I see here is discipleship. What I see here is a pattern. There's so much more than just the double portion. You see, from the first verse, we know that Elijah is going to be taken away. The question now is, what will Elisha do? What will Elisha do? Will he return home and become an oxen farmer? Because you know, when Jesus left, the disciples went back to being fishermen. So Elisha has a choice here. Will he go back to his old life or will he continue on and continue Elijah's ministry? You see, by this point, Elijah, the older, had been discipling Elisha for 10 years. 10 years. And Elijah's going on this journey and we see this pattern. Elijah says, stay here. I'm going to go to Bethel. And Elisha says, no, I'm going to go with you. And Elijah leads and Elisha follows. And then they get there and Elijah again says, stay here. I'm going to go to Jericho. And of course, Elisha says, no, I'm going to go with you. And Elijah leads and Elisha follows. You see, I believe this journey is a test for Elisha. Every time they stop, Elijah gives Elisha an option to stay behind. And every time, Elisha continues. And they finally end up at the Jordan River. And Elijah rolls up his cloak. He hits the water and splits it. And they walk across on dry ground. And then, of course, Elisha asks for a double portion and that's exactly what he's giving, given. Elisha's ministry lasts about 50 years, or twice as long as his mentor, Elijah. We know that Elisha performed twice as many recorded miracles as his mentor, Elijah. And when Elijah was swept away, you have to picture this, guys. You have to really picture this. Elijah was swept away. His mentor was taken away, and his coat fell. And Elisha goes over, he picks up his mentor's coat, and he goes to the River Jordan, and Elijah's last miracle becomes Elisha's first miracle. He strikes the water, and it splits. You see, as a pastor, it's my job to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And I think it's so easy for us as Christians to come into church and just get comfortable and to just go through the motions. Like I said, it's my prayer tonight that the Holy Spirit stirs something up inside of you and you don't leave here, you don't leave here the same person that you came. This story is so important to me. It reaches home to me so much. As most of you guys know, I started drinking and using drugs at the age of 14. By the time I was 18, I was a full-blown drug addict and alcoholic. And I love when Pastor Gary shares how he came to know the Lord because I came to know the Lord the exact same way. A beautiful, blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl who wouldn't go out with me because I wasn't a Christian. So, of course, I went to church. But the problem was I was never properly discipled. On March 3rd, 2001, I accepted Jesus Christ into my life as my Savior. Not my Lord and my Savior, but as my Savior. I just wanted to get out on jail free card. I was never properly discipled. I, had, I never had somebody there to help raise me and mature me in my faith. I never had an Elijah. 
I just thought I could continue to live my life like a heathen, and I could go to bed every night, and I could ask for forgiveness, and God would always forgive me. I didn't realize that the Bible taught you that you can't serve two masters. You'll love one, and you'll hate the other. Or that a house divided against itself will fall. I didn't realize that Jesus Christ was our Lord and our Savior, not one or the other. You see, I never had somebody there to raise me up. And I think as a society, we understand this, right? You would never take a child, throw him on the street and say, good luck. But in the church, we fall so short. We have people coming into the church and we're not properly discipling them. And if we're looking at our perfect role model, Jesus, what did Jesus do? He discipled people. He discipled people. Have you guys ever played that, uh, that game? At, it's probably maybe at a wedding or maybe on Valentine's Day here we did it. Or maybe at a marriage conference where you raise your hand and then you try to figure out who's been married the longest. Have you guys played that game before? You know what I'm talking about? They say, okay, who's been married for one week? And everyone that's been married one week puts their hand up. Who's been married for one month? And everyone who hasn't been married at least a month puts their hand down. Who's been married a year? Who's been married five years? And by the end of it, you have the couple that's been married the longest. And it's usually the summers because I'm pretty sure that they've been, al- been married more th- longer than I've been alive. I'm almost positive of that. What did you know that as Christians, we are the bride of Christ, that we are in a marriage covenant with God? So I wanna play that game, okay? If you've been a Christian for at least one day, I want you to raise your hand, all right? If there's somebody sitting next to you and they don't have their hand raised, it is your job when you leave here to talk to them about Jesus Christ and ask them if they wanna commit have them commit Jesus Christ into their life as their Lord and Savior, amen? Okay, who's been here, who who has been a Christian for at least one month, keep your hand up. If you've been a Christian for at least one month. If you've been a Christian for at least one year, keep your hand up. If you've been a Christian for at least five years, keep your hand up. If you've been a Christian for 10 years, keep your hand up. If you've been a Christian for 15 years, keep your hand up. If you've been a Christian for 20 years, keep your hand up. Okay, everyone can put their hand down. The point here is not who's been a Christian the longest. My point is that there's hundreds of years of experience in this building. But I'd be curious to know how many of you guys are mentoring somebody? How many of you guys here are discipling somebody? Meeting with them on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis. Teaching them, equipping them, helping somebody mature in their faith. Or maybe you're sitting out there saying, well, I just don't have the time. Or maybe you're sitting out there saying, well, he's not talking about me. I'm already mentoring somebody. Woohoo! I'm doing good. All the while, there's somebody screaming for your help. There's somebody in your life that's screaming for you to mentor them. This is personal to me because when I went to Teen Challenge which is a a Christian discipleship program for people with addiction, it wasn't until I finished Teen Challenge that I realized how crucial discipleship really is. And when I got out of Teen Challenge, I went into a church just like this that was filled with hundreds of people, with hundreds of years of experience, and I was crying out for someone to mentor me. But nobody had the time. Here's what I wanna tell you. At the end of the day, You won't remember the time that you didn't have. You'll look back and you'll be thankful for being able to pour into somebody's life and to see what that godly man or woman has turned into. We can easily justify why we're not discipling somebody, why we're not mentoring somebody. We can say, well, I don't have time or I'm already mentoring somebody. But if we look at Jesus Christ, can we really use that excuse? Really? Jesus traveled around the known world preaching and teaching and healing the sick and running for his life at some points, yet he found time to disciple 12 people and arguably more. Are you discipling 12 people? I'm not here to to try to condemn you or convince you that you need to 
to, to be discipling or mentoring 12 people. I'm just here to open up your eyes a little bit. That there's somebody in your life right now, there's somebody in your sphere of influence right now that probably needs the wisdom that you have. You see, we could easily justify, I could easily justify, who am I to mentor somebody? I'm a drug ex, drug addict, alcoholic thief. But have you ever thought why you're here? Why you're here tonight? What has shaped you to become the man or woman that you are right now? What has caused you to be in this church? You see, I believe God knew exactly where you would be right now. I believe God knew exactly the person that you would be, the passions that you would have, the gifts that you would have, the platform that you would have. He has very purposefully designed your life. He has made you uniquely significant. And he's put people in your life so that way you can impact their lives. Let that sink in. How would you live your life differently if you knew that there is somebody in your life that God has orchestrated to be in your life How would you pour into that person? Because I believe that when we realize that we're designed for a purpose, we live for a purpose. You see, Pastor Steve, a few weeks ago, when he was preaching about sharing Jesus, he said that he thinks all of us understand the concept as Christians that we're supposed to share our faith. I would agree with him. If you're in here tonight and you're a Christian, you probably have heard or understand that we're supposed to share our faith, right? And we use that scripture to to go and make disciples out of nations. But the problem is that we're misreading that that verse. It doesn't doesn't say go and make converts out of nations. It says to go and make disciples out of nations. And if we accept the challenge... If we accept the calling to share our faith, we should also embrace the idea of discipling somebody. So are you following Christ's role? Because it's clear that while Christ was here, one of his purposes was to disciple people. Or are you just justifying why you can't mentor somebody? Maybe you're a new Christian Or maybe you've been a Christian your whole life, but you're saying to yourself, well, I don't know that much. How am I gonna mentor somebody? I don't even know that much. Well, you'd be surprised at what you know when you talk to somebody that doesn't know it. Because there was a point that you didn't know it. We take advantage of what we know. We take for granted that we know things and we just expect that everyone knows them. Let me tell you, that's not true. Don't think that what you don't know should stop you from walking with somebody in the Lord. Should stop you from walking and guiding and mentoring somebody in your life. Don't let the devil trick you into thinking that you're not in the right place to mentor somebody. I'm I'm a firm believer that we should all have Paul's in our life. We should all have men or women that are mentoring us. And we should also have Timothys in our lives, people that we are mentoring and we are pouring into. And then we should also have the person that's walking right beside us. The person that's in the same place as us. The person that can hold us accountable. I believe it's biblical. Doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for a year or for 30 years. I believe it's biblical that we have people around us that are helping us mature in our faith. You see, discipleship is just simply this. It's a Christian helping somebody to become more like Christ, to help them mature in their faith. And you know, here's the secret. An old person can be mentored by a younger person. Doesn't matter the age so much. But it doesn't happen overnight. It just doesn't happen overnight. That's why I entitled this message, Think Long and Prosper. There's a story of an old sage He's walking down a road and he comes across a man who's planting a cherub tree. And the wise sage asked the man, how long is it gonna take for that tree to bear fruit? And the man says, 70 years. And the wise old sage says, are you sure you're gonna be able to be around in 70 years to be able to see fruit from that tree? 
And the man says, possibly not. But there was cherub trees that were in full bloom that had fruit when I came here. And they were planted by somebody before me. So I'm planting these seeds for the next generation. You see, we got to think long to prosper. Because it's, inter- it's interesting when you look throughout the scriptures how Jesus uses agriculture to spread biblical truths. Many spiritual, many spiritual uh, realities are taught to us by agriculture. Why? Because people understand the basic concept of planting a seed and then waiting for it to bear fruit. I mean, even today, I'm not a farmer. I can't grow anything besides weeds in our yard. But I understand that if I plant a tomato seed, that I'm not going to come out tomorrow and find a tomato. And I'm even smart enough to know that when I plant a tomato seed and a little bit of green sprouts up, that I'm still not going to come out tomorrow and find a tomato. We all understand the concept of what it looks like to plant, what it looks like to wait for it to bear fruit. And throughout the Bible, we see a God who thinks in terms of generations. We see a Bible, uh, throughout the Bible, a God who thinks in the long term. From the book of Genesis, he already has an answer to sin, and yet it's thousands of years until Jesus walks the earth. We see the book of Revelations, which is still in a time to come. We see a, serve a God who thinks generationally. Now, every story has a Genesis, and thinking long investing in somebody's life, pouring into somebody's life, planting that seed in somebody's life is the genesis for provision. When we plant a seed, you never know when or where or how it will bear fruit. Generations down the road, there might be fruit that's being bared because you planted the seed today in somebody's life. Remember, we serve a God who who thinks in generations, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I know one thing that's true is that the Bible never, never goes out of style. The words that are in here are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you may not be the person that brings millions of people to the Lord, but you may plant a seed in somebody's life today who goes off and disciples somebody, who disciples somebody, who disciples somebody, who years down the road will become the next Billy Graham and will fill stadiums and bring people to the Lord. Every great Christian leader, you could probably ask everyone on the pastoral staff who that person was that poured into their life to make them the man that they are today. And many of you have people in your lives that have poured into your life to help you mature and to the man or woman that you've become today. Because it's important. A seed needs to be planted for it to be able to grow. Now, very quickly, I wanna give you three points or three keys to discipling or mentoring somebody I'm doing this because some of you will leave here and you'll know right away how to disciple somebody. Some of you will leave here and know right away how to mentor somebody. But some of you now will say, okay, I know that I should mentor somebody. I know that I should disciple somebody, but I have no idea what that even looks like. How do I do that? So I wanna give you three points and these points could and probably should be a sermon in their own. I promise you they're not gonna be. It's, the, it's just simply this, lead, follow, and get out of the way. Lead, follow, and get out of the way. Throughout the Bible, we see this pattern. I'm not gonna go through the whole Bible and give you examples because we just don't have time. So I'm simply gonna use the story that I read at the beginning of this message from Elisha and Elijah. Lead, follow and get out of the way. The best way I can describe this, the best visual image I have, is when you have a little child and they know how to walk but they're still too little to really walk on their own. When you get out of the car and you're walking into the store through the parking lot or you're crossing the road, you hold that little child's hand, right? You hold them and you lead them across the parking lot because you don't want that child to get hurt. You don't want that child to get hit by a car or maybe stolen, taken. But as the child gets a little bit older, 
You don't necessarily have to hold their hand. Now you can lead and they can follow you. And when you stop, they stop. And when you look left, they look left. And when you look right, they look right. And when you cross, they cross. And of course, there's the get out of the way. Eventually, that little child grows up to be a full-grown adult, and you just gotta get out of the way because they're probably getting to the store faster than you are. When you lead somebody, you take a very active role in their life. You teach them. You coach them. You, sometimes you're, there, you're, you're their cheerleader. Sometimes you gotta talk wisdom into them. Sometimes you gotta speak hard truths into them. Sometimes you love them. Sometimes you just have to be an empathetic ear. But it all depends and all changes. But the idea of leading somebody is that you're leading your life in a way that personifies Christ so that way they can follow. And we see that in Elijah and Elisha. Elijah leads for 10 years and Elisha follows. And then we get to the story tonight and Elijah leads and Elisha follows. And Elijah leads and Elisha follows. There's a pattern. But there's two phases of following. First, the person follows and watches what you're doing. Right, like a little child. They watch what mommy and daddy are doing. And as you lead that life, that Christ-like life, the person that you're mentoring follows and they just watch along and they see what you're doing. They see how you're acting. But then there's a transition from when they're following you, watching you, to following you and doing what you do. We see that again in Elijah and Elisha. Elijah leads and Elisha follows, but when Elijah's taken away and his cloak falls, Elisha picks up his cloak, he goes over to the Jordan River, and now he follows what his mentor just did, and he strikes the water and splits it. So he goes from following to following to doing, right? Worship team, if you guys want to come on up. There's two ministries and the Assemblies of God that I think are the best. And you guys can have your own opinions and you guys can have whatever ministry you like the best. But there's two ministries that I like the best, that I think are the best. And one of them, of course, is Teen Challenge. And the other one is Chi Alpha. Because these two ministries understand the idea of discipling people. They understand the idea of helping people mature to become strong, godly men and women. And Teen Challenge, I love it because there's a drug epidemic and the, the world is just being filled with drug addicts. And there's only one solution and that's Jesus Christ. And I love Chi Alpha because the, the whole entire world is coming to the universities in America and we have an opportunity to spread the gospel right on our campuses. And they do a great job of bringing in students and not only having them accept Jesus Christ into their lives, but also discipling them. And we went to our sectional council yesterday and I found out something I didn't know, but South Texas, the district that we're in, sends out more missionaries than the entire, any other district and the Assemblies of God in America. And that's largely due to one Chi Alpha group who's bringing in young men and women from the university when they, when they come onto campus as freshmen. And if, regardless of whether they know they're doing this or not, they're doing this. They're leading them. They're allowing them to follow. Then they're giving them the opportunity to do ministry. And then they're getting out of the way and letting them go. And because of that, there's hundreds of missionaries coming out of this one Chi Alpha going all over the United States and all over the world. Because they're leading, they're letting them follow, and then they're getting out of the way. And if you've done your job as a mentor, the ultimate goal should be your ceiling should be their floor. Your ceiling should be their floor. They should go further, farther, faster, and longer than you have. And again, we see that in Elijah and Elisha. When Elijah gets out of the way and Elisha gets to go, he goes twice as long and has double portion. 
Now imagine if you discipled somebody and they got a double portion. Then they went out and discipled somebody and they got a double portion of a double portion. And they went out and discipled somebody and got a double portion of a double portion of a double portion. Think compound interest here. It would be unstoppable. But it takes one seed. It takes us planting that one seed. If everyone could please stand. Tonight, I just wanted to, to, to open your eyes because there's probably many, many people in here tonight that could use a mentor. There's probably many of you in here tonight that could be a mentor. And my prayer for you tonight is this, that if you don't have a mentor, that you'll pray and you'll come up to the altars and you'll ask God to provide a godly man or a godly woman to be your mentor. And if you're not mentoring somebody, my prayer is that you'd come up to the altar and you would ask God, who is that person in my life that I could plant a seed into theirs? And if you're already mentoring somebody, I would come up and I would ask, Lord, is there somebody else? And then ask God for wisdom. Because mentorship is not as easy as I made it look, out to, look to be. There's gonna be highs and there's gonna be lows. People constantly disappointed Jesus. So why would we be any different? But the point is that we need to keep continuing to press on towards that perfection which is found only in Christ Jesus. We'll never get there, but we can continue to pour out the love that Christ has poured down on us. The great thing about being a mentor is, the fact is, you don't even have to be in the same room as people. Two of my mentors live in Ohio, and we just have a date. At the first and the third Tuesday of every month, we meet for an hour via Skype, and they're able to pour into my life. And a few of the people I mentor, they live in New Jersey, and we do the exact same thing. But you have to be intentional about it. You can't just expect it to pop into your lap. That's why my prayer is that when that door opens and you recognize it, that you'll not only be hearers of the word, but you'll also be doers. If you could please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you so for so freely freeing us. Thank you for the mentors that you put in each of our lives. Thank you for the mentors that you're going to provide for us. Lord God, I pray that you would open up the doors for us to be able to pour into somebody's life. Lord God, I, I pray that we wouldn't think it's just enough to share our faith, but we would help that person mature and to their faith. And while the dynamics may change, Lord God, I pray that you would give us the wisdom and the knowledge and the revelation and the understanding of who you are and how you would deal with this situation. And I know, Holy Spirit, that you will speak to us. Lord God, we praise you, we worship you, Lord God. Just open up our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The altars are open if you'd like to come forward.